Hey, what's up, everybody? It's Ned Bellavance, Ned1313 on Twitter. Welcome to Daily Check-In for August 21st, 2020. It's Friday, so we are going to be talking about Vault, and we're going to be talking about the Vault certification, and specifically the objective that deals with Secrets Engines, which, if we're being honest about Vault, Secrets Engines are kind of where it's at. Vault would be basically a useless product without these engines. Because the whole point is secrets lifecycle management within Vault. So if you don't have secrets engines, you don't really have anything, do you? So it's kind of an important topic. And it's weird that the objective that surrounds that topic is actually very short. But it's probably going to take me two, I'm going to say two episodes to get through this objective. It's objective number five. So that's what we're going to talk about today. A couple housekeeping items. First, I have officially updated the Terraform certification guide for version 0.13 of Terraform. There were a few pretty important advancements, and I have a whole video that I'll you know, put a card up here uh, if it's of interest to you what's new in Terraform 13. But the important thing is there were enough changes that it's going to change the guide that I created and probably some of the questions in the certification because things that were not possible before are now possible. So if you haven't already picked up the guide, I'll include a link in the notes. If you have picked up the guide, a new version is available. You may have gotten an email if you signed up for that. If you didn't, well, just go check. It's LeanPub so you get free updates for life. So awesome there. The second thing is, I don't know if everybody realizes this who subscribed to the YouTube channel, but I also produce this as a podcast, an audio-only podcast that's available on Anchor.fm, or you should be able to find it in any of your podcatchers. It's on Google Podcasts and Spotify and Apple, etc. So if you prefer an audio format, you can find this as a podcast instead. And I I've noticed that I've been picking up subscribers on YouTube, but not as many on the podcast, and it might be just because I haven't talked about it as much. So just a quick reminder that the podcast does exist if you prefer that medium for getting your information. So that's all I have from a housekeeping perspective. Let's catch up. Let's check in. How you doing? You made it. You made it, friend. You made it to Friday. And that is, whew, man, it's it's been a long week. Not going to lie. Some challenges. I learned how hard it is to take care of a turtle, an aquatic turtle. Um, they are, they're filthy. <laughs> I mean, it's not their fault. You know, generally speaking, they'd have a much larger pond or something. It wouldn't matter so much that they kind of poop in the water. But when they're in a tank, it's up to you to keep that clean. And I did not realize how often you have to clean it. So now I know. And I may never get the smell out of my nostrils, but it's an important lesson. If you're thinking about getting an aquatic turtle, just it's going to require some cleaning and maintenance. Just bear that in mind. <laughs> so that's my story. Let's talk about HashiCorp Vault certification, objective number five. And let me just go through this real quick. I got it in my notes. Objective five is compare and configure Vault Secrets engines. And there's four sub objectives here. The sub objectives are choose a secret method based on use case. Contrast dynamic secrets versus static secrets and their use cases. Define transit engine and define secrets engine. Now, if I read these, to me, they seem like they're in reverse order of how I would want to talk about them. I can't ask you to pick a secrets method based on a use case if you don't know what a secrets engine is. Uh, likewise, you don't know what a transit engine is or I haven't talked about it. So how are you going to decide that's the correct application? And if you don't understand what the engines are, how do you know what a dynamic versus a static secret engine is? And won't that factor into the use case? So the whole thing's like backwards to me. And, you know, that's not a knock on anybody. I don't think they ordered these in the order that you have to study. It was just that's how they were written down. With that in mind, I'm going to do it in reverse. So we're going to start with defining secrets engines in this episode, and then we'll move on to transit engines. I don't really, I'm not going to have time to get into the nitty gritty, and transit engine does seem to play uh, an important role in the minds of people at HashiCorp, so I want to give it its due when it comes to talking about it. I'm probably going to do a whole video on that with examples, just so you get a real feel for what transit engine does. It's pretty cool. So let's start at bare minimum here, what is a secrets engine? What does it do? A secrets engine is all about, well, it's, 
let's see. What did they do? They actually have it defined. A secrets engine allows the storage, generation, and encryption of data. And that's kind of core to everything that Vault does. So when you have a secrets engine, it is somehow dealing with data. And that data is important and probably sensitive. So it needs to be stored and retrievable in a secure way. So that's what the secrets engine is set out to do. Now that data can be dynamically generated by Vault by interacting with the service, or it can be information that you are sending to Vault for storage. So something you've generated and you're sending. So that's kind of the difference between dynamic and static secrets. Dynamic are generally generated by Vault and static secrets are something you've generated and you just want Vault to store for you. So that is kind of at a high level what secrets engines are. You, the secrets engines are plugins to the Vault architecture. Now, a little bit different than with Terraform, those plugins, as far as I can tell, are bundled with the Vault executable, or at least they're bundled somehow with Vault. You can use third-party plugins or your own custom plugins, but you have to specify that when you're enabling it and you have to add the plugin through uh, an admin action that requires sudo permissions. So that is possible you can add it in, but it has a bunch bundled all already with it. So it's, it's a slightly different in that regard than Terraform, which pulls down its plugins for the various providers. Now, if you want to enable a secrets engine, what, what do you do? Well, you use the enable command, either through the CLI or the API, or you do it through the, the user interface, you enable a secrets engine and you enable it at a path. Most of the secrets engines, well, all of them have a default path and that's usually their name. So if you enable the AWS secrets engine, it's going to enable itself at the path AWS. You can customize that and you can enable multiple instances of the same secrets engine. So let's say you were managing multiple AWS accounts you could have an AWS secrets engine mounted at different paths, one for each account that you want to work with. That's one example of how you might use this path option. And then when you wanted to configure it, you would have to specify that path. Another thing that you can do is disable a secrets engine. And you do this with care because when you disable a secrets engine, it removes all of the data that was stored by that secrets engine and it is not retrievable. So uh, tread lightly because you're going to end up deleting all the secrets that were managed by that secrets engine, as well as its configuration. So that, that, that's, that's serious. Be careful with that. You can also move a secrets engine to a different path. So if you start out with one AWS provider and realized, oh my goodness, we have multiple AWS accounts, I want to move that first secrets engine I created at the default path, you can do that through the move. Bearing in mind that any is, existing secrets will automatically be revoked because the data path is changing, but the configuration data will be maintained. So you just have to recreate those secrets. And in an AWS world, they would just be dynamically recreated when the next request came in. You can also tune a secrets engine and tuning just changes some of the configuration of that secrets engine. Now, once you've enabled a secrets engine, generally there's a setup process there where you have to configure it. For instance, the AWS secrets engine, it talks directly to AWS IAM to create uh, users and roles within IAM. So knowing that, or I should say instance profiles and users. So knowing that it does that, you need to configure this secrets engine to be able to talk to your account with some credentials and you're probably also going to, going to want to create roles that are assumed by anyone who's getting a secret from the secrets engine. Okay, so that those are the things that secrets engines can uh, you can interact with. There are about 22 different secrets engines. I counted them. That does not count all the different database types that are supported by the database secrets engine. So there's a bunch of different database types that are all supported by this database secrets engine. Uh, I didn't even count how many, but there were a lot. Uh, I already mentioned that you can use your own plugin to, to expand Vault, but uh, you'd have to be able to write it in Go, and that's a very advanced topic. There's no way that's going to be on the exam. I do want to go over some commonly used secrets engines that you should probably know a decent amount about when you're going into the exam, and just to use Vault in general. First one is the key value store, KV. 
The KV engine has two different versions, version one and version two. You should understand what the differences are between those two versions and why you might want to choose one over the other. It's kind of important. The second one is cloud providers. There are a bunch of different cloud providers. I already talked about the AWS one. There's one for Microsoft Azure. There's one for Google. I'm sure there's one for Oracle Cloud or something. Those are all about controlling credentials and access to those clouds and being able to have a user request credentials that are dynamically generated and revoked after a certain period of time. It's a pretty powerful thing. You can also have applications and machines request credentials like a CI CD process. Pretty cool stuff there. There is a special secrets engine called the Cubbyhole. The Cubbyhole is created per token that was generated on Vault. So every time a token is generated on Vault, a Cubby Cubbyhole is created for that token. And nothing can access the contents of that Cubbyhole except for that token, not even the root token. It can't get into that Cubbyhole. So that Cubbyhole is pretty important. It, the Cubbyhole Secrets Engine itself is enabled by default. It cannot be moved. It cannot be disabled. And you can't create multiple instances of it. There's only one. And it's generally used for response wrapping. So rather than sending a secret directly to a client, you could wrap that secret and put it in their cubbyhole and then send the unwrap token to the end device or machine or user, and then they can retrieve the actual secret from their cubbyhole. So the secret itself is not transmitted in that initial exchange. And it, you can set it to be a single use type thing, so you can only access the secret once. That's pretty cool. The next thing is identity. The identity secrets engine is enabled by default and it's used by Vault as their identity management solution. It doesn't replace tokens, it augments tokens with things like aliases and entities. And I'm sure we'll get into that in a different objective, but just be aware of the identity secrets engine and the fact that you also cannot disable that or move it and it's enabled by default. The last one, and we're gonna do a whole other episode on this is the transit engine. The transit engine provides encryption as a service, basically. It's really cool. And like I said, I'm going to do a whole episode just about that. But know about those commonly used secrets engines because they're definitely going to come up because they're so commonly used and they're so core to how people interact with Vault. So I think I covered all the bases on understanding what a secrets engine is. And we even got into... Uh, dynamic versus static static secrets a little bit. I think the next episode, we're going to talk specifically about the transit engine. I'm going to have some examples for you so you can get more comfortable with the transit engine. And then we'll probably have one more for this objective about choosing a secret method based off of use case and dynamic versus static secrets. So I think that's the plan. That's all I have for today. I know I ran a little bit long, but I really wanted to get all those different commonly used engines in this episode so we can move to a different sub objective next time. That also does it for the week. I'll be back on Monday with my standard professional development episode. So please tune in then. In the meantime, if you don't mind subscribing to the channel or sharing it with someone, I'd really, really appreciate that. Until next time, 